it is so good to be in a noise room. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, today's summit. Uh, uh, good morning again. It's uh, simply absolutely a pleasure to stand before you this morning and, and have an opportunity to address you and congratulate the noise program and NSF and you on uh, 20 years of exemplary and impactful service uh, through the Robin Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. So I'm Sandra Richardson, and uh, the Noyce community is certainly my home. I uh, was a program officer in Noyce for quite some time and served as program lead. Uh, and I'm still at NSF, but in a different area. But because Noyce is so near and dear to my heart, my colleagues at NSF uh, were gracious enough to invite me to come. And I'm so glad that I was able to make it just uh, to, to be a part of the celebration because it indeed is just that. So 20 years is a long time, but in another aspect, 20 years is like the blink of an eye. So to be gathered here in celebration of 20 years of service for the NOISE program really sends a message about the longevity and the impact of the program. But it also uh, reminds us of all the continued challenges and opportunities that we are faced with in, in teacher education and specifically a STEM teacher education. So, and of course we each have a role to play in addressing these challenges and opportunities and uh, you know, removing barriers and creating innovation in teacher education and uh, addressing today's needs while leveraging all the research that we now know about uh, teacher preparation and retention. But the NOISE program uh, has made great contributions in this area, and that's uh, what the summit celebrates. While the learning opportunity is also certainly a celebration. And so I am hopeful that in the next uh, 20 years at uh, the NOISE program's future 40th uh, anniversary celebration, my wonderful NOISE colleagues and all of you will be here, uh, including our closing session uh, presenters, Kathleen and Shirley, who you'll hear from in a bit, and, and, and we'll be talking about the transformative work that's happened in the past 20 years. Uh, and we'll be at a different place and have a different type of conversation. So I won't uh, belabor this point and I, I won't be here uh, long because I know you're excited and ready to get to our closing plenary. Um, but I do just want to say that, you know, in 20 more years, I am, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to celebrate that all students, regardless of zip code or background, will have access to a noise prepared teacher. That all students will have access to noise prepared teacher leaders, that, that those who, who govern and run our schools will be impacted by a noise scholarship and research that has been funded through the years. And this would be great. I know you would agree with me. So I hope that the three days of this year's summit and moreover your collective experience with the noise program uh, will lay the needed framework and, and collaboration and set of experiences to get us all there. So I'm delighted now to just congratulate you again and thank you for your many contributions to NOISE. And I will turn the mic over to our uh, division director for the Division of Undergraduate Education where our NOISE programs house, uh, Dr. Rosalind Hargraves. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Wow, these lights are bright up here. I guess people say that all the time. First off, thank you, Sandra Richardson, for all of your work that you have done, both in your former life as a NOISE PI and in your current life as the um, lead for the EPSCOR program and your in-between life with the NOISE program. Thank you so much. <laughs> As Sandra so graciously mentioned, I am Rosalind Hobson Hargraves, and I have the pleasure of serving as the division director for the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation, which is home to the Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. It has been my pleasure to be with you over the past few days, and now on the final day, Y'all, we gonna say goodbye. On the final day of the Noise Summit, in the words of the Boys to Men song, it's so hard to say goodbye to y'all. <laughs> there is a tradition in the US South that when you meet someone, and y'all from the South, y'all know this, you say hi, you say where you're from, and then they ask, who are your people? 
right? Who are your people? So, and I'm from my family, not I'm from, I'm from DC, but my family's from Powhatan, Virginia. And so I'm used to getting that, who are your people? Well, I'm here at the Noise Summit with my people. Now I say that because even though I am a trained engineer with a bunch of STEM folks in my family, you know, a bunch of cousins who are engineers, my parents were STEM majors, my sisters were engineers, um, both my grandmothers were educators. In fact, my grandma Hobson fought to desegregate schools in Powhatan, Virginia, which is another whole story, and there's a whole lot to unpack about the desegregation of schools in the South, but that's for another day and another noise summit. Um, I have two aunts who were also teachers, and my cousin just retired from Jersey City Public Schools, where she served as a math educator, both between Jersey City and New York City for over 30 years. So y'all, I got teaching, and STEM in my blood, so I'm here with my people, the Noyce, the Noyce family. Um, not only am I, are y'all my people because of being a STEM educator, but also because I was a former Noyce PI myself. And a big shout out, I'm gonna do a lot of shout outs, y'all. A big shout out to my VC Noyce and RTR family. So glad that you all are continuing, yay! Um, to do all the wonderful work. I really do miss y'all, and y'all know that. Um, when I think about my time attending these summits as a PI, I recall the days of extensive learning, the exciting opportunity to interact with the broader noise community. Um, when we were having struggles, I got to talk to some other noise PIs and say, how are y'all handling this? Um, how are y'all recruiting your teachers? All those, just being able to share those stories. And so I hope that at this, our first summit together in like two years, that you have been able to also enjoy the plenary presentations, the networking opportunities, presenting your projects, and hearing the voices of our noise scholars and fellows. This year's summit was unique in that we are also celebrating 20 years, and I could go through a whole bunch of things of what can happen in two decades. Um, but for us, it has been an opportunity to reflect on the past 20 years of noise and to look forward to the next, as Sandra said, 20 years of noise. And we know that we need qualified STEM teachers now more than ever. And the impact of the group of you and is having on our nation is monumental. Part of the net mission of the National Science Foundation is to promote the progress of science. Over multiple generations, our society has made huge leaps in scientific research, technological development, and advancement towards a better future. We can accredit these inventions and these scientific discoveries to the inventors and to the scientists, but we know when we think about the journey that each of those scientists and inventors took, where did it start? It started with a STEM teacher inspiring them and influencing, influencing them to become that STEM professional. So it is our teachers, especially our K-12 science teachers and math teachers and engineering teachers, STEM broadly, that are inspiring that next generation of scientists and technologists and researchers. I'm talking about y'all, and y'all know that. You are inspiring that next generation of scientists and engineers technicians and technologists, mathematicians and economists, inventors and researchers. You are imparting the essential knowledge of how our world works today on our youth. And without you, our teachers, to ignite a spark of curiosity in a child's mind, y'all light that match and get them interested in science and math, that child would most likely not grow up to change the world with the power of STEM. It is, essential, it is especially important that all students have access to quality STEM education. And that means ensuring that there are qualified teachers in all of our schools, including in our high need school districts. Our students in high need schools have some of the brightest minds. I went to DC public schools, I know. And y'all know DC public schools, now I'm talking about, I went to DC public schools like 40 years ago. And y'all know DC public schools have probably had a bit of a reputation of not being the best in the country. But we know that talent can be found anywhere, but opportunity 
is not. And so it is our STEM teachers that help provide the opportunities and facilitate the opportunities for our children to grow into being who, people who will potentially change the world through the power of STEM. So when I came to NSF, I came with the fundamental core values of access, equity, excellence, and innovation. And NOICE embodies these values. The NOICE program has allowed more than 12,000, let's sit with that, 12,000 qualified STEM teachers to enter classrooms of high need schools and change lives and change history. In order to not only promote the progress of science, but also promote the progress of equitable education, we need all children to have access to high qualified, highly qualified teachers. And for the past 20 years, NOICE has made great strides in achieving this mission. And I thank each and every one of you for your contributions to the NOICE program. So I thank each and every one of you for your, for your contributions to the work of the NOICE program. The NOICE program has had a significant role in enhancing the STEM education landscape in high need schools and will continue to do that in the future. As always, on the last day of a conference, I sit back and reflect. I reflect on what I've learned, I reflect on what I take with me, and I'm especially um, thankful that this conference has given me a number of gems to take with me. It has reinforced my belief, as Kathleen Bergen said in the video, that teaching is the noblest profession and that my middle school daughter is in good hands with you as our teachers. I am leaving thinking about exploring those 11 lines of inquiry that Dr. Gist um, talk to us about building a more ethno-racially diverse teaching workforce. And I am also thinking about unpacking my own bias, like Jay Walmstead talked about yesterday, because I actually also took the IAT test with my class, and man, oh man, I was shocked at my bias. Because it turned out I was biased against myself. Now, I, I proceeded to talk about, think about how I was gonna, this can't be right, how could I be biased against um, women in STEM or blacks in STEM. Do I hate myself? Well, no, it's not the case. What it, what it revealed to me is the insidious nature of structural racism that is embedded in our culture. And so not only did I have to impact all my bias, it also made me think I need some therapy too, y'all, because that's not something you really want to live with. So, I want to give a shout out set, there's going to be a lot of shout outs, to our teachers and PIs who joined our session yesterday. Thank you so much. You gave um, us at NSF lots to think about as we imagine the future and dream about the possibilities for our NOICE program, and especially as we're thinking about the future, the next 20 years of NOICE. And as educators, as we in the Division of Undergraduate Education are committed educators, we believe and are committed to lifelong learning and, and continuous improvement, and we will do that with NOICE. So the future is bright for the NOICE program. But now, but I'm, um, I'm not quite done pulling all my gems together about what I'm going to take with me because I have the pleasure of welcoming to the stage two lionesses in the field. Kathleen Bergen, who is the lead program officer for the NOICE program and a lifelong educator who she says, who, who self-proclaims that her passion is teaching. And her partner in crime, I mean education, her partner in education, Dr. Shirley Malcolm, who wrote the seminal work on exploring intersectionality in STEM. I remember when I first came across her book, The Double Bind, The Price of Being a Minority Woman in Science, I was like, oh, she gets me. She knows my struggle. These two legends and giants in the field will help us continue our discussion of reflection on this conference and where we will go in the future. So as I welcome these two, y'all can come on up to the stage. Um, I know they are gonna give us a lot to be inspired by and to think about. And I also need to do two more shout outs. Two, three, hold on, let me see. Um, so I also wanna thank AAAS, yay AAAS for putting 
Wave your hands, all my AAAS people. Wave, wave, wave. All right, let's give them a little, yes, round of applause. We can do that. We're not in Zoom, and they get to hear us. Um, as well as our noise program team. Can I have my noise, noise program team? Can you wave your hands? I know some of y'all are around. So thank you for your continued work and service to the program. And last but not least, our NOICE PIs, our NOICE scholars, our NOICE fellows, y'all can wave your hands. Thank you for all that you do. And if you're waving, you're also doing the ASL sign for thank you. We're clapping your, our hands for you. So thank you for all the work that you do. Now, it is my great pleasure. Kathleen and Shirley, take it away. So, Shirley, before we get started, I, I, it's, it's on you, girl. I, <laughs> um, I, I just, I, I too want to give a shout out to AAAS, um, uh, Lauren, Marin, uh, Betty Kaminger, Chantel Fuque, and I may have butchered names because I usually just call people by their first name. And, and so I, I know their last names because of email addresses. You know? <laughs> but, and Travis York, they have been amazing colleagues throughout this in, in the preparation of the first face-to-face -face in two years. I mean, it, it's amazing. So I just want to thank AAAS hugely because they pulled this off. And I, and I want to give a shout out to my colleague, my co-lead colleague, uh, Jennifer Ellis. Because Where's Jennifer? She's way over someplace. OK. Uh, Jennifer was the liaison throughout everything in preparation for this conference. And these things don't just happen because you thought of them. <laughs> well, you know how hard I know. You know I know how hard this conference is to put on. I mean, what? Jennifer has a little friend with her. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that it's a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's not just trying to make sure that you have a stimulating program and that you're able to make people feel welcome and things like this, but. The logistics are insane, absolutely insane. So I agree with you. It's fabulous staff. But you have a, such a great program, everybody wants to turn out and do their best. Well, we're very fortunate. And uh, also, my last shout out is uh, to all the researchers that have contributed to our celebratory track four book. I hope all of you, you, you're welcome to take more than one copy, because I know they have some. And, um, and yeah, yeah that's, that's worthy of applause. And I hope that, and, and by the way, there are more track four projects than are represented in that book. These were the ones that were far enough along, but we've been funding some recently. But so we'll have future maybe addendums or something. But, I hope this will also encourage you to, if not you as the researcher, for you to go back and encourage your colleagues as researchers to join this community, because this is an amazing community. That's, that's the end of my thank yous. Thank okay. you for right, right now. For right now. OK. Uh, Kathleen and I have been doing these kinds of dog and pony shows <laughs> for a while now. Uh, the first one we did. We always have a theme, okay? The first one we did, uh, the theme was um, ecosystems, right? And in a way, it's not just because this reflects an ecosystem, but it is, <laughs> I cheated, I'm an ecologist by training. <laughs> I, you know, even though I've been faculty and I've taught high school and things like this, my, my, my heart and my training are in ecology, evolutionary biology, and um, um, behavior. So we had that as our first thing, okay? And then the second time, Kathleen said, can't do ecology, e ecosystems again. <laughs> Gotta do something different, okay? So uh, since she tells me what I have to do, <laughs> 
I tried. The only problem was that the programs and everything that we heard kept evolving to the whole question about ecosystems. So we ended up doing ecosystems again. But this time she said, we are not doing ecosystem. So I was challenged essentially to try to come up with something else. That's what we do all the time. We challenge our and colleagues. And if we can get the first slide up on the thing, Ima Bobby, you can see what we came up with. No, yeah, get, I mean, get it's us, not up get there. Get us off the screen. It's not up there. You, you've seen us. They're going to put the slide up any minute now. And you can see that Roz will love us for doing this. Can, can we have the, yeah, yay, rock, hey, <laughs> for technology. Thank you, thank you. So that reveals uh, essentially what we came up with, infrastructure. Um, you know, it was interesting, the, the plenary speaker the first night was talking about all those streams that she kept talking about structural, 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 structural. And it was almost a no-brainer by that time to really talk about, try to figure out about structures. But then when you started thinking about it, it just kind of opened up. You know, there are barriers, there are gateways, there are detours, there are bridges. Um, sometimes you need a GPS navigation system to figure out how to get around. Um, so there's it, it lots of stuff going on. Uh, there are on-ramps, off-ramps. And sometimes you, you have to start building new ways yes. of getting there. Yes. And maybe the there is a new way. And by the way, everything about infrastructure is about STEM. Now, first of all, what comes to my mind is engineers, right? Right. Uh, because they're responsible for a lot of what we think of as infrastructure, roads and bridges and buildings. But there are other kinds of broadband. Yes, broadband. Cell towers, sewage systems, water lines. <laughs> Mathematics is part of the infrastructure. You can't, you can't do it without math. You can't do it without biology. So we wanted to have a conversation with you about what we have gleaned from this meeting that really leads us to thinking about our collective opportunities, our collective assets that we bring to moving the educational infrastructure forward to reach every single child and provide them with successful experiences in STEM so they can know they can be a scientist, they can be an engineer. They can be a mathematician. They can be a computer science. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that there are different uh, levels of infrastructure in different, in different communities, okay? Whether we want it or not, various levels of repair and disrepair. Well, and, you know, um, some of our policies are beyond not inclusive. Yep. Um, you all know that sometimes when an entity wants to build a new highway, they typically go and put that new highway through under-resourced communities. I know. Well, I mean, the thing is that that sends a very bad message in terms of what people, how they value or undervalue these communities. So infrastructure ends up being a really nice metaphor. And then I remembered that, you know, in, when I was on the science board, we talked about um, not just the physical, but also the human infrastructure for STEM. And so it really became a nice kind of a way to begin to talk about what we are trying to convey here of the kinds of themes that occurred, that popped up in the conversation. Uh, one of the other things too that is really interesting 
is that infrastructure can be really, really simple or really, really complicated. I don't know if that's Spaghetti Junction, <laughs> but uh, I, I live in Atlanta now, and uh, forget it, Spaghetti Junction is pretty famous because you want to talk about getting confused. I mean, you know, you're from Georgia, you know how ugly that thing is, <laughs> and most of the time it's clogged. But in any case, it can be <clears throat> really, really simple, like the little red schoolhouse kind of a thing, or it can be really, really complicated. And I think that's the kind of thing that we really wanted to try to, try to convey uh, that to a certain extent we went from this kind of one teacher, one school of the old days and, and that didn't disappear until like in the 60s. You still had rural areas that had um, uh, kind of one school, one room schoolhouse where the teacher was, uh, but originally it was the case of where the teacher was identified and hired by the community. And sometimes she lived with the families, she lived with families in the community. The pay was so low, I think it was the only, only women would take it. But in any <laughs> case, um, it was the, uh, the kind of quintessential connection between the people and the schools. And we need to get back to making those connections. We need to get back to the people in the schools because uh, to a certain extent we have lost some of, the, some of the thinking that goes along with really understanding the needs of communities and being in communities and really kind of reflecting that. But you know, in the, uh, in the video that, uh, I love the video by the way, Kathleen, you were brilliant, but in any case, <laughs> In the video, <clears throat> the, the, the people who made the video asked me if I would reflect a little bit on my own time in school. And what I did at that, I said, you know, what it was like to go to school in the segregated South, in Jim Crow South, where all of my teachers, well, all of my, all of, every other student there looked just like me and all those teachers were around. And yet, now we have a diversity problem within teaching. And I always used to wonder, well, where did everybody go? Well, I, to a certain extent, I used to think, well, you know, people who are really good in math and science, they have lots of options. Maybe they went to work in industry, or maybe they went to work in government, or wherever they may. But if you re read um, Vanessa, Vanessa Seidel Walker's work, the, last, the Lost Education of Horace Tate, mm -hmm. she's in, in Atlanta too. Uh, I do not, I haven't met her, but uh, reading this, the, the kind of the, that desegregation basically led to the firing dis and dismissal of black teachers and principals. And so all of a sudden, the kind of route into teaching was disrupted. It's like, okay, where's the, it was like that part of the road was taken out because the people who become teachers are often the children of teachers. And so when you disrupt that route, all of a sudden you're in someplace totally different. But you know a good news thing? In this room, there are projects that that's what they took on, was finding and supporting teachers of their communities. Yes. That will, they, they know the community, they are of the community, which is what you're talking about. Yes, and I love and the voices from are, the field where that came oh, out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said to Shirley when we were sitting down um, working on our vision for what we had heard through this meeting, and I said, maybe we should just not do us and just roll the, you're, I'm old, roll the film of what the, the voices from the field, because they were and are amazing. And if, if all the teachers in the United States were like that set of teachers, we would have no problems whatsoever. But 
But that's what I'm telling you. The good news is, in this room right now, are the teachers that are of their communities yes. and returning and staying in their communities. Yes. And, and staying in their communities, and that's a really important thing. I mean, I was really, I was really blown away by the c connection and the authenticity that was there. Um, people who, I mean, anybody who comes out with a d degree in computer science can go any place, okay? Because every industry needs them. But making an affirmative statement, and I'm staying here because my students, my community, needs what I have to offer. I mean, that, that was really, really moving to me. Yes, I agree. They so, all we need, I mean, quite frankly, they are not role models. They're sitting there for a student, with students, for students, and they offer an opportunity for students to see, yes, this is what teachers look like, and this is what teachers do. And there is the opportunity for the people who are in the classroom to really begin to like, I want to be that when I grow up. I want to do that when I grow up. And I know you care a lot about kind of passing on this passion for teaching. Well, and those people that were up here are representative of the people in the room. And they bring that passion, commitment, and deliberateness. And yes, we have a track wonderfully uh, for master teacher fellows that are becoming leaders. But I felt like I was seeing leaders up here, people that can go into their schools and work with other teachers to provide the exceptional learning experiences that they're providing in their classrooms yes. right now. Yes, absolutely. You know, the infrastructure theme uh, c really carried over very, very well in talking about some of the challenges that we have uh, with regard to things like school systems and school boards and watching people want to manipulate policy to, you can do it for the good, but you can also do it for the exclusion. And uh, I have seen in too many cases efforts to thwart for example, desegregation rulings uh, through secession. I mean, there in my own uh, home county, Jefferson County, Alabama, and the kind of things that have been going on with Jefferson County and Gardendale around this whole question of, of secession, uh, breaking the school district up in such a way that you resegregate. Now, it's really, but that's an infrastructure thing. That is creating another piece of, of uh, structure, mm -hmm, as it were, mm -hmm. so that you can undo mm -hmm, some of the mm -hmm. things that are, that are happening. So it's a lot, this thing cuts both ways. Well, and the crazy thing, and, and you all know this, this is like, what? the 60,000 pound gorilla in the room. This country is eventually, in a very short period of time, going to be more people of color than white. I mean, I'm just gonna say it. Where do we think our teachers are gonna come from? Where do we think our engineers are gonna come from? Where do we think our doctors are going? Where do we, we think uh, we're trying to get to, the, to Mars, where do we think the next Dr. Johnson's and Dr. Where, where are they gonna come from? They're going to come from our communities of color. And you're an ecologist and I made you stay away from the ecosystem thing. But, but I'm, <laughs> what you don't know is you got two biologists up here both, both have spent a lot of our lives in Georgia, so I don't know how that happened, but here we are. But I used to think about people were really concerned, and some people still are, and it's a good thing. They're concerned about losing the rainforests and the jungles because 
there are things in those places that may hold the cure for Alzheimer's, may hold the cure for lung cancer. And if we wipe the jungle out before we even find that root, we won't ever have it. I worry about who we're losing in my classroom that could be the person that solves immuno diseases, that, that solves the next pandemic. Well, look at the last pandemic. <laughs> if you look at the diversity of the people who were involved in standing up that vaccine, I mean, this, and you look at the fact that the people who were doing the research were from all over the world, and that contributions came from all the corners of the world. That's the way that science really has to operate. And so, to a certain extent, we've got to think long and hard about what are the infrastructure issues that actually affect that. Uh, I do want to say, though, that what we are seeing right now is that we do not really honor the history. How did we get here? Okay. Um, and I want to talk about, just for a moment, using infrastructure to advance or repel social justice. Now, on the right is my, high my old high school, George Washington Carver High School. The site where it's located is now an EPA Superfund site. I told people I have no idea of what kinds of things might be in my body. I probably glow in the dark, but I, just, <laughs> I, I, I do not know. But that, that's part of the reality. That school was built to keep black students from demanding a right to go into Phillips High School, which is like this cathedral to learning. And I think about the numbers that to you, you read about Phillips and you talk about the sheer numbers of chemistry labs. We had one and we didn't have the chemicals that we needed for, the, for many of the experiments that we wanted to do. So the chemistry teacher carved out a little group of us and we would come in early and start synthesizing things that we would, that the other students would need for their laboratories. Now, that was both good and bad. It was good for me in the sense of giving me a sense of agency around this, but it was bad in the sense that we really could not offer authentic experiences. But these kinds, this continuum of miseducation or of devaluing or no education, I mean, that, that goes all the way back to slave codes where it was illegal to teach people, to, to, to teach enslaved people to read or write. Uh, and there was, a, even once slavery ended, there was underinvestment in the education of children of color. And there were economic impediments in the sense that a lot of people were, a lot of previously enslaved people were sharecroppers. So they needed the boys and the girls too out in the fields with them in order to kind of make ends meet. So David Wilson, the President Morgan, talks about, he came from one of these families and he talks about the fact that he didn't go to school every day for years and years and years because he had to be out helping, you know, with the family. But the, the, this notion of, th these issues didn't just pop up. And we have to own our problems, but we also have to move beyond them. And it's the moving beyond them by getting good teachers who are willing to say, the abuse stops here and that we're going to go and we're going to give quality education to everyone. That is what, in fact, we need, and this is the opportunity that was this. And this room is this committed room. to that. This room, okay? This room provides us that opportunity. You know, the goals of education have also evolved over time. Um, schools were originally set up to promote literacy so that people could learn to read and write so they could read the Bible. And over time, as the world became a lot more complicated, we began to understand that we had to prepare people to live in a scientifically and technologically 
really complicated place. And that is, I think, where we are right now. The world's a lot more complicated than it was for my grandmother. She, she went to the seventh grade. And uh, she was a very smart person, but the opportunity was not there. And that's the point. The talent is everywhere, but the opportunity is not. And so we're in the opportunity business here. We are. OK. Um, but the other thing is with regard to the goals of uh, education is that uh, it's not clear what they are. Um, is it to prepare people for the scientific and technologically impacted world? To promote patriotism? Um, this is a very uncomfortable conversation because science is about finding what is true. And that can sometimes rub the wrong way in fact-free environments. So it's a tough one. It is a tough one, but it's also a simple one. Yes. And, and, and what I mean by that is the goal of education needs to be to bring the assets of every person that presents themselves. So I, I almost said child, but a lot of you are uh, teachers of, at the higher education. So the goals of education be, should be to, for every person that presents themselves, my job is to find the assets and build with them. Yes build with them on the assets they bring so that they can go where they want to go, yes. not where I decide they can go or not go. And the, because they have lots of opportunities to innovate, they can help all, move all of us forward. And that is a thing that is exciting to me. You know, continuing on the infrastructure theme, uh, Kathleen asked me to relabel this, okay? It was called Concerns, but she said, I want to be positive. So she said, let's do opportunity. And I said, okay, let's do opportunity. But right now, they're disguised as problems. <laughs> and so uh, in terms of thinking about infrastructure again, it's easier, and one of our speakers actually talked about this, that it's easier to demolish than it is to build. And that we have to think about what will replace what, we, what is torn down? But that's an opportunity. What, you gonna, what are we going to build instead? Uh, I heard a lot of the conversations about mentors, finding them, needing them, being them. And that was, a, I think, a major theme. Yes. And I come away from this meeting feeling that Everybody in this work, in this room, has been moving towards or already is a mentor, but they, they've also identified mentors in their own lives that make, that help them recognize they have agency. Yes, absolutely. I, and that's one of the things that I hope that we will, we will, get, we will get away from despairing and feeling as though we are just kind of the objects of whatever is going on and realize that there is the opportunity to really exercise our own agency. Um, NSF has a criteria that, you know, talk with their proposals about technical merit and broader impacts, and my connection to the second one is long and tortured, <laughs> and we won't talk about it. However, what is the broader impacts? And the broader impacts of the people in this room are scary. They're so good. Okay, not only the, the, the young people they touch, but who those people touch, their families, their communities. There's like uh, incredible opportunities. Their feel, they're thinking differently about where, the, where their discipline should go and how to use that knowledge in different kinds of ways. And as you so vividly pointed out, the larger scientific enterprise begins here. 
you know, th this, this next generation is going to be created by the people who are here. And so what kinds of values and what kinds of ideas and energy do we want passed along? And I think that there's a lot of thinking about that, not just knowledge, because I kept hearing this theme of we've got to understand who our, young, who our students are as people, who our students are as humans, and we've got to understand that there's an opportunity to affect them as people, and that the knowledge is good, and the formal attention to the knowledge is good, but also in the context of people, especially given the, 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 what has been happening with regard to COVID. Well, as we all know, um, COVID um, underscored, revealed, put into bold print the inequities of our country. Um, but I still see this as a moment of opportunity. Yes. Because we have people in this room that did their practice teaching online and then went into schools and did hybrid teaching. And they made it happen. They made it happen. And that gives me tremendous hope. And we need to study it and learn from it. And, and if you're one of those teachers, you need to to say, I did this, and how can we study it? Because we need to be working on the nodes in this network of inequity. Yes. Yeah, but we, have, first of all, have to see the inequity. And that was one of the things, the kind of fish don't, the fish don't see the water moment that we talk about and think about. But we they really do need to understand how structural racism and sexism have affected our communities and continue to do so. Because until we see that, we can't do anything about it. And we cannot respond with the kinds of responsive pedagogy, the kinds of stories that help people connect to their own communities and connect science and engineering and mathematics and technology to the needs of their community. I mean, Flint, Flint well, is a story of, you know, that it's a story of infrastructure. But uh, you, you know, the thing about the Flint, <laughs> they need to replace all the pipes, right? Everybody knows about what happened in Flint, right? Because lead pipes, by the way, there's still lead pop pipes in a lot of communities. They need to be replaced, right? They do not need to be replaced with what should have been put in 40 years ago. They need to be replaced with the newest and the best technology that we have. And we need to always be looking for that. What is it? You have tools. <laughs> I can remember when a little handheld calculator cost over $1,000 for a little handheld calculator. Now, we have tools. And our kids are using these tools. And we can use these tools. But my main point here is, when we're thinking about infrastructure, whether it's, it's the physical infrastructure or the people infrastructure, we need to be thinking about what is the next best thing that we can provide so that people thrive. It really should be about people thriving. Yes, absolutely. And the people who, you know, I was so thrilled to see the research publication because uh, we, we needed that. We, we need to begin to bring together what we know, what we understand, so that it can begin to inform what we do. And that, so the question is, the next kind of question is, what are we studying and what are we not? And who is actually doing the studying? Because the lenses that we bring are often very much reflected in what, how we see uh, this work. And you know, um, over the years I have heard uh, different communities um, say yes to researchers that want to come in and study them. But those communities have been very frustrated because they weren't invited 
to be part of the research. They were being asked if they could be studied. Now, I'm an organism, and I don't want you to study me, but I'd be happy to contribute to a study on whatever kind of organism we need to be studying or community. And so it's really important, um, the, the movement towards uh, research partnerships and practice, that's really a shift that we need to embrace where our researchers are coming together with our communities and saying, what is it you, you as a community feel you want to learn about, about your community? And how can we be part of designing back to infrastructure? Right. It's always about design, which I know the engineers claim it, but I'm gonna claim it too. <laughs> There was this other issue about the goals in education. You know, where, where are we trying to go? Um, I think this is one of the Alice in Wonderland Cheshire Cat things that Yogi Berra has also said. It, it, <laughs> it, it, uh, Alice asked where did, uh, which way do I go? And, and, um, and the, the Cheshire Cat <laughs> said, well, where are you trying to get to? And in this particular case, it was, well, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So we've got to begin to really figure out where we want to go. And if we need GPS, fine. Let's just try to have those kinds of conversations. But we also heard one of our scholars and- Yes, we need, we need people to really begin to push out those ideas so that we're there. So then we evolved to, uh, or devolved, to Kathleen's concern about looking at assets, agency, and authenticity, because this came up a lot in the conversation. What are the assets that are out there within the community? Uh, I, let's start with the most uh, visible asset, and that's the knowledgeable, committed, and intentional people, you. This room, that's a major asset. And uh, I think that beginning there is a good place to begin. I think that's worthy of celebration. Thank yes. you for being you. Honestly, you bring so much. And then you, you leave us and you go out and you do so much more. So yes, that is where it starts, but necessary, but not sufficient. I know, I know. Because quite frankly, you have a lot more power if you're networked and, you're com and you are linked and you're brought together, uh, and if there are structures that are in place that can actually help you to, be to become even more powerful. Now, I think that's another aspect to all of this, whether that is the, the networks that are virtual or the networks that are real or just the networks that, are, that you want to build. So, so we hope you've taken advantage of connecting to people you never recognize. I recognize that when you have a project and you get away to a place that's not home, it's really nice to meet with your project team and work on some work. But I also know that you've been networking with each other to learn from each other. And you have this Wahoova app or however you pronounce it <laughs> that allows you to network. Now, eventually, that, that'll go away in about three months, I understand. So grab whatever you need. In truth, the uh, nsfnoise.org website that AAAS hosts and, and maintains will have the presentations from this meeting, not, not the breakouts, but the other things. But the networking, you need to, to start um, making those solid. Yeah, I mean, there are people who are doing things that you might be interested in doing. And finding out the kind of very practical things, for example, I heard discussions about project-based learning. And if somebody's actually doing that and you want to be, and you want to be able to incorporate it, but you need some very practical kinds of tips about how you can do it in the environment that you find yourself, that's very useful to find those people and find out those Find out what those strategies are. Absolutely. 
But you know, the where you're going thing about the infrastructure, you need to have an idea where you're trying to go. I know that you have heard so much, not only in the presentations that were up here, but in the breakout sessions. And, and it can be overwhelming because there's so many opportunities and so many things that you could do. Pick one and do it with a vengeance. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that is, um, I, I do want to lift up in all of this is that in some cases we have detractors and it is important to hear what they are saying, to listen and hear what they are saying so that we can we can convey a sense about where we are trying to go, not where they say that we are trying to go. And so I think that that's really an important kind of a message. And I want to underscore what you have there about. Yeah, tell, understanding the larger forces that are out there. But telling your story. Telling your story. We will basically come back to this because it is really an important issue. And that's Shirley's Law. I have a friend who I said this to him, uh, kind of like as an aside, Randy Olson. I don't know if anybody's actually read Don't Be Such a Scientist, but Randy called it in his book, in his Shirley's Law. If you don't tell your own story, someone else will tell it for you, and you probably won't like it. Are you telling your own story? Are we, in fact, conveying the sense about what we are trying to accomplish and what difference it makes. And I think that is an absolutely critical, critical issue, these times in particular, because otherwise there is no narrative out there that, would, that describes your classroom and your school and your community. There is this other uh, narrative that is out there that really isn't true to what you're building. And, you know, we heard from our uh, colleagues who are indigenous people that stories and hearing from the elders, that's a natural thing for, for that community. Some of us are not as good about telling our stories. Yes. And we need to tell our stories so that others understand. So that others understand the power of what the students in your room are capable of. And when I was a teacher, I used to love to tell those stories at a cocktail party. And people would be looking at me like, but it's so powerful to see what happens with students when they are, um, emboldened, and I'm going to come back with, to that word agency, their own agency, that, that they're told they have it, yes. they own it. They don't have to find it someplace else. Nobody can, has to give it to them. Well, the stories that I heard here, I mean, um, the voices from the field, I'm willing to admit I sat there crying. They were so, they were so poignant what people are trying to deal with, what they're trying to support within their communities. So I sat there crying. And um, I think that that conveys the notion of the power of the story to move people. And on that, I think that I just want to say that I always enjoy the opportunity to come and chat with you, Kathleen, see if we can figure out the major big ideas that have, have really defined this meeting, although it's impossible to do so because there's so much going on. But you are talking about the structures that can make a difference in people's lives, but not just in people's lives, but in our economy and in our democracy. And so you're in the business not just of finding and, build, and building out talent, but also supporting the best principles of our country.
So thanks to all of you. We wish you very safe travels to wherever you are going. I hope some of the noise scholars and fellows are going to take advantage of, of some of the museum tours that are set up. And um, we are so pleased and privileged to be part of this community with you and to be celebrating 20 years of work that you are a part of. And so I want to leave you with a charge, an action item. I think all workshops are supposed to end with an action item. Every, you're all in the business of recruiting if you're a PI. I already know that. So I'm really more focused right now on um, the STEM teachers, the noise teachers, the noise fellows, the noise master teacher fellows. And I'd like to ask you to consider making a commitment to yourself that this year you will look for two people to bring into teaching and that you will look for people that bring diverse perspectives to our community. If every teacher that is a noise teacher, and, and I already know their projects that the noise alumni are some of their best recruiters, but if you'll connect to people that are wherever they are, but I think about your home institution that are majoring in a discipline that you know would be great teachers, it means a whole lot for a person to look you in the face and say, Shirley, you'd make a great teacher. And with that, is our music ready? Listen to the words. World won't get no better. You and me. Us. Wake up. <laughs>